Dr. Che is an associate professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation and biomedical engineering at the Case Western Reserve University. He received his bachelor's and master's degree in BME, biomedical engineering, from Duke University and Dartmouth College, respectively. He received his MD and his clinical training in PM&R from New Jersey Medical School. He completed the Rehabilitation Medicine Scientist Training Program Fellowship in 1998 at Case Western Reserve University. Currently, he's the Director of Research for the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and the Associate Director of Clinical Affairs for the Cleveland Functional Electrical Stimulation Center. His research is funded by NIH and focuses on the application of FES for neuroprostheses, neuroplasticity, and shoulder dysfunction in hemiplegia. He has disseminated his information in the form of multiple publications, and um, he commands an international reputation and a national reputation. He serves on the editorial boards of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Archives and Neural Rehabilitation and Neural Repair. He recently completed service as a member and chair of the NIH, NICHD um, review panel called Function, Integration, and Rehabilitation Sciences. And he currently uh, serves on the advisory board of the National Center for Medical Rehabilitation Research at the NIH. He has also been invited to give numerous presentations worldwide and, um, and he has been asked uh, and appointed to review on scientific panels worldwide. Um, he has received an award for almost every year uh, after his graduation, which is really extraordinary when you, when you think about it. His most recent award, and I should say that one of the toughest audiences that we have to face as professionals is our own peer group. And from this group, the Association of Academic Physiatrists, Dr. Che received the 2007 Bradham Research Award, which recognizes an individual who over the previous decade has had the most significant impact on the science and practice of rehabilitation medicine. I think a really singular award. So with that, Dr. Shea. Thank you, Janice. Well, that's a lot more than I gave you. I don't know where you got all that information from. <laughs> so um, oh, good morning, all. Uh, I think this NP might be a little bit different than traditional. Uh, I really would like some of your feedback. and kind of share a little bit of my soul, if you will, on things that's worked well and things that haven't so worked work well. So today's topic is percutaneous intramuscular electrical stimulation for hemiplegic shoulder pain. As usual, I do have some disclosures. I will describe a device that's been investigated under an FDA IDE. I also serve as a consultant to NDI Medical, who has a commercial interest in the device or the approach that we will be talking about today. So where did it all start? Well. Fall of 1989, just started my senior year in medical school, and I was uh, doing a rotation at Kessler Institute for, uh, for PM&R. And during that rotation, senior uh, resident told me, John, if you can figure out a treatment for shoulder pain and stroke patients, you'll be a very rich man. Well, I'm still not, not rich, but this is a, an area that's uh, of significant interest to me. I finished my residency in 94 at Kessler and New Jersey Medical School, and then I came to uh, Case in 94, uh, where uh, I uh, started a, uh, a fellowship in the Rehabilitation Medicine Scientist Training Program with Hunter as my mentor. I finished that in 98. So with that brief background, what's my objective today? We're going to describe the epidemiology and postulated ideologies of hemiplegic shoulder pain. We will describe the development of intramuscular electrical stimulation as a treatment modality for this particular condition. We'll assess the effectiveness and safety of uh, intramuscular electrical stimulation. And then we'll describe the necessary steps for clinical implementation of this approach. 
So let's talk about prevalence. Prevalence is defined as the amount, number of individuals that have a particular condition at a particular time and point, uh, as versus incidence, which is a number of new cases. Prevalence in stroke survivors for shoulder pain has to be really uh, presented from two perspectives. One is what they call unselected population, that is all comers. Uh, and then selected, those individuals who are severely impaired enough to require inpatient or some sort of rehabilitation. And prevalence in terms of stroke is always linked to the onset or time onset of the actual event. And really the most important uh, statement here is really this, uh, the most recent article by Lindgren and Associates in Journal of Stroke. The prevalence of stroke pain, uh, sh hemiplegic shoulder pain is 22% at four months, but at 12 months it's still 24%. And there are some data that goes beyond this to approximately four years. And, but those are only really uh, for individuals who are more severely impaired. Now, having said that, if you look at a selected group of stroke survivors, the prevalence is substantially higher. Okay, so prevalence is almost 60% at four months post-stroke if, you uh, if, you if you're severely impaired enough to require inpatient rehabilitation. In this particular group, uh, if you go out four years, approximately 25 to 30 percent still have significant shoulder pain. So it's, it's quite a, a prevalent condition and a very serious one. Now why is it relevant? Well, hemiplegic shoulder pain is very strongly associated with motor impairment, associated with reduced activities limitation, as well as reduced quality of life, and therefore is a major rehabilitation problem. Impact is quite significant. If you look at the incidence, the number of new stroke survivors per year, 750,000 per year, uh, approximately 17% uh, will die within 30 days. That translates to each year approximately 150,000 new individuals at one year post-stroke exhibiting shoulder pain. Now you add that to the prevalent population, which is the number of individuals who actually have stroke right now in the U.S. is 5.8 million. In that 5.8 million, if I estimate approximately 10% having shoulder pain, that's 580,000 individuals. Certainly this has clinical implications, but also commercial entities love to hear these numbers as well. Clearly, shoulder pain has a significant impact in, uh, in, the public, uh, in public health. Now this is a very busy slide. When we ask the question, what's the cause of shoulder pain and hemiplegia? The answer is, we don't know. And so, like any good researcher, you have to come up with a conceptual framework to start your process. So here's my conceptual framework. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but uh, that's what we'll, we'll be testing. So I have a background a little bit before I do this. You know, uh, unlike most joints in the human body, the shoulder is an extremely mobile joint. And as a result, uh, it's very uh, unstable by nature. The joint is stabilized primarily by muscles, in particular the, the uh, rotator cuff muscles, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor. There's very little ligamentous uh, uh, mechanical stability for the shoulder in comparison to other uh, joints of the body. So then you have a stroke, and what does stroke do? Well, cause spasticity, overactivity when you don't want it, and weakness, decreased strength when you do need it. And I postulate this, these two entities have a significant impact in the mechanical instability of the shoulder. With this mechanical instability is manifested by a number of things, joint malalignment, reduced range of motion, scapular malrotation, impingement syndrome, as well as subluxation. But these, I believe, uh, put our joint, shoulder joint, at significant risk for micro and macro trauma, leading to inflammation and degeneration of the capsule as well as extracapsular uh, tissue, including tendons, muscles, and bursa, leading to capsulitis and contractures of the capsule, tendonitis, tendinosis, tears, as well as bursitis, and of course leading to pain. And this pain then further reduces the immobility of the, uh, uh, increased immobility of the shoulder. And this immobility has a significant impact on stroke, of course. As you all know, stroke recovery is activity dependent. So if you have immobility, this further accentuates our hemiparesis. And from a neuroplasticity perspective, it's got a very negative impact, which then may have a vicious cycle of worsening mechanical instability. And there's some other issues as well. For example, spasticity may direct, directly cause pain by causing periosteal traction and so on. 
So again, mechanical instability is the major factor, I believe, uh, in contributing to hemiplegic shoulder pain. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, neuropathic pain is, doesn't have a role. It certainly does have a role. But in this particular model, um, we're focusing on mechanical causes of shoulder pain. There are a lot of treatments. In fact, if you were to survey the literature, and, and, and the surveys have been done in natural clinical practice, there are more than 150 different treatments. And generally, there's no consensus as to which is effective, which means that we don't really know what we're doing. <coughs> However, with the exception of surface electrical stimulation to reduce subluxation, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just say that only exception to this is surface electrical stimulation to reduce subluxation. <clears throat> All other treatment options have been shown to be ineffective. This statement is uh, supported by three practice guidelines or evidence-based reviews that came out since 2004. The first one is by Tiesel, uh, that came out in 2004, I believe, and the statement is quite strong. There is strong evidence that FES reduces pain and subluxation and improves muscle function and shoulder range of motion. Pam Duncan and her group with the VA Department of Defense uh, practice guideline says that surface electrical stimulation may be effective for reducing subluxation and pain based on good evidence. And the most recent, the Ottawa panel from Canada also recommended FES for acute and chronic phases. So clearly, the literature supports the use of surface electrical stimulation to reduce shoulder pain. Well, let's go back and I'm back here now in 1994, 1995. Tom, can I get that slide just a minute? Sure. Strong evidence may be effective. These are kind of words that... Clinicians use. Oh, are they? Okay. They're not really selling points then. No, these are, these, are, uh, these are what they believe the evidence shows at this point. So this is the best evidence that exists as compared to, let's say, shoulder positioning. Moderate evidence for no effect may be effective based on fair evidence. An Ottawa panel recommend, i.e. consensus, we don't believe there's evidence there. Shoulder slings, moderate evidence for no effect. The VA didn't even choose to comment. Ottawa panel says recommend, but no, no evidence. So that, this, these statements have to be compared to these statements, okay. you know, which is, uh, and, and, and for many, it's kind of like looking at the uh, Cochrane Review. I don't know if you guys have seen the Cochrane Review in medicine. I don't ever remember them ever saying anything works. So I think in, in medicine where we don't have the ability to control every variable, our ability to say something is far more limited. And so it's more of a, uh, a probability statement, if you will. So, uh, so I come to case in 94. And uh, at that time, the surface simulation studies have been, were emerging. And of course, shoulder pain existed. So I said, well, let's try it. And I tried it in multiple patients. And of course, they love it initially. And uh, oh, by the way, when the initial surface stimulation studies were done, they were all done in inpatient rehab. When people were able to stay for six months, four months, that's not real anymore. You know, our, our patients stay a couple of weeks. And so all this has to happen now in the outpatient setting. Well, they love it. I showed them how to do it. Then they call me, your doctor said, this isn't working anymore a week or two afterwards. And of course, I haven't come in, and, and the electrodes are nowhere near where I put them. And I ask them, so are you doing six hours a day? Wow, six hours a day, that's, that's, that's a lot. You know, maybe an hour. Um, so if you were to survey the therapist, the rehab physicians, um, this is not being used. Uh, most su stroke survivors cannot tolerate six hours a day for six weeks of surface stimulation. Electro reliability is poor, uh, stimulation is poor because you need skill to find these motor points. And as a result, it's poor compliance, and of course, it doesn't help that there's right now lack of reimbursement for this intervention. So not surprisingly, in 1986, when Baker and Parker, who did, by the way, did the first randomized clinical trial of surface electrical stimulation for shoulder pain, said this, until implanted electro systems become available, long-term use of surface electrical stimulation can be managed by only a few patients and their families. By the way, this is the one that actually led to the development of bions. I didn't know that at the time, because I was just a naive first year, second year attending. So I said, well, why not try something different? The FES Center has this percutaneous system. If I implant this thing, there shouldn't be any pain with, pain with uh, stimulation. 
And of course, the electrodes don't have to be donned and doffed each time, so let's try it. And so uh, I applied for a Pepper Pilot Project Grant. Bob, do you remember reviewing this? So Bob reviewed this particular grant, and he said, OK. So I got a little money to do some studies. And of course, uh, I had no idea how to implant these things. So guess who I went to? Hi, Ron. Ron Hart taught me how to do percutaneous implants. Did a nice job. And we had this NPS4, which is a pretty heavy box, but this is all we had at the time. And of course, my patients walk. And uh, you know this was a problem. But nevertheless, this, from a perspective of uh, feasibility, we thought, let's give it a try. So in our first patient, uh, we Im implanted this. And it, it was, the implantation was remarkably smooth. Uh, the IRB the IRB environment has changed a lot since that time, so I would never do it the way I did it then. But clearly, uh, here I took an x-ray. Uh, this is the unaffected shoulder, well-approximated glenohumeral joint. This is the affected side without the stimulation with the subluxation. And when the stimulation is on, you reduce the subluxation. So from a biological perspective, it looks like, oh, this is working well. And this patient had no pain. When that stimulation went on, I didn't, they did it. hey, this, this feels great. In fact, this guy fell asleep with it. So our initial suspicion was, was, appeared to be correct. It's well tolerated. Implantation is relatively easy. And it's, it appears to be quite effective in reducing subluxation. Well, like in 1996, and uh, I was asked to present at Tom's Applied Neurocontrol Research Day. Of course, the only thing I had was this at the time. I was only been in the case for two years. And then I presented this. And then this little short guy from Neurocontrol named Ping Feng comes up and he says, so John, what, what do you need to make this thing work? Well, you know, right now it's not really a clinically viable system because my stroke survivors walk and they can't lug around this huge expense, this heavy device. So I need a small system, a little, little, little small system like a beeper. So he said, I can do that for you. And so we got SP, uh, they got SPIR funding uh, with, my, with myself as a co-investigator and developed this little stimulator, uh, a page size stimulator. And with that, uh, SBIR funding and the addition of the uh, PEPPER grant, we did a small study, a case series. Uh, it's a before and after trial, uh, eight chronic stroke survivors with pain and subluxation. And they were stimulated for six hours a day for six weeks without any difficulty. We stimulated supraspinatus and posterior deltoid. Why? Because that's what surface stimulation studies did. Uh, and David Yu, who I was training at the time, also did some specific uh, muscle selection studies indicating that the posterior deltoid was actually quite good. Turns out supraspinatus was not, but we did it this way only because that's how the surface stimulation studies did it. Then we followed the patients for three months, and of course we tested the hypothesis, the pain level uh, at follow up would be lower compared to baseline. And what did we find? Well, first of all, from an outcome measure, BPI 15, or brief pain inventory question 15, is simply a 0 to 10 numeric rating scale. 0 means no pain, 10 is the worst pain ever. But it really simply asks, what's your pain right now? And uh, pre-treatment was 4.8, and post-treatment 1.9, and stay there at three months. And this, these are statistically significant. The other common outcome measure was pain-free external rotation range of motion. And this improved significantly from 18.5 to 36.9. But after the, tr uh, uh, after the treatment was done, the, uh, that, that value actually declined a little bit, which is OK, because it suggests some, some specificity of treatment. From a mechanistic perspective, we looked at shoulder subluxation using radiographs. And there was a 10.3 millimeter uh, subluxation at baseline that went down to 5. And that went even further to 3.3. Whether this is real or not, uh, I, I don't know. But certainly compared to baseline, these are significant. We were uh, hypothesizing or speculating that electrical stimulation has an impact on motor impairment or mo motor recovery. And so we uh, measured Fugelmeyer, and that went up from 5 to 6, then to 15.5, which is kind of odd because you thought, well, gee, if, you, if, you, if this is what the stimulation is, why is there only such a small change here and a big change there? And I don't know the answer to that question specifically, but I can speculate. Perhaps what this did really not provide any mechanical increase, but rather simply reduced the pain. And as they reduced the pain, they used the limb more. And as they used the limb more, they actually had more uh, function of this uh, improvement in, in arm, arm function. Yes? These are beyond six months. So you wouldn't necessarily expect recovery. But you know what? I haven't seen a single case series that's been negative. So by definition, you know, case series are always suspect. So this could be our reviewers' wishful thinking.
or it could be a placebo effect. Now, after we finished that study, our colleagues in Enskede, uh, 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 Martin Eisenman, said, you know, this is pretty interesting stuff. You know, I think we want to try this. And so I said, great. So we sent David Yu over there to train them how to use the implantation, but we weren't involved at all in the study. That this is your study. We want this to be done independently of us. So uh, they did their study with 15 stroke survivors, chronic again, uh, with pain and subluxation. Uh, same exact stimulation paradigm, six hours a day for six weeks, same muscles. But instead of three months, they chose to go six months. And instead of using BPI-15, uh, they chose to use BPI-12, which is actually a better measure. BPI-12 says, what was the worst pain in the last seven days? Not just simply a random one time, but rather in the last seven days, what was your worst pain? And furthermore, they said, we want to measure quality of life. We want to know what the real life impact of this intervention is in quality of life. So their study was, act, their study was very similar in results. I think their results are actually a little more dramatic. Uh, their pain level was higher because they were using BPI-12, which again is the worst pain in the last seven days. But what's remarkable is that after the explant, 12 weeks and 24 weeks, their worst pain score was actually better than ours. Now, I can't explain why that's the case. Uh, but uh, their results are quite, quite remarkable. A little bit different, but still consistent with what we found. Uh, SF36 is what they use for quality of life. And as expected, the bodily pain component was substantially better compared to baseline. Other measures were not uh, terribly significant. Uh, actually, this is a baseline, I'm sorry, right here. And so all these measures seem to have improved some, but did not reach uh, statistical significance. But bodily pain, and not only reached statistical significance, it was also maintained at, at six months. When they looked at pain-free range of motion, that also improved substantially. In contrast to our study, their pain-free range of motion actually was maintained and even got better uh, up to six months. Uh, their motor function, uh, well, their response was more like what I would have expected, that is more of an improvement during the stimulation period and then just a gradual, uh, well, this really isn't a change. Uh, you know, this is very small, cha small changes in Fugelmeyer, so whether it's real clinically or not, it's not all that clear, but st statistically, uh, they're significant. Now, there, are, there were other preliminary studies, by the way, but I didn't, in, in the interest of time, I chose not to review those. Um, so what do we learn from these uh, preliminary studies? Uh, well, it seems like this is clinically feasible. It may reduce shoulder pain. It may improve quality of life, and it may improve motor function and subluxation. And I say these are all may because, I, as I alluded to or stated earlier, I have never seen a case series that's been published that's negative. So this may all be false. Uh, these stroke survivors preferred the implanted system over a sling. There was clearly no discomfort during stimulation. It was easy to apply. And for those patients we've seen, it appeared to be very safe. So by this time, Neurocontrol is, is very, very excited. And so they obtained additional funding, SBIR phase two, and additional uh, venture capital funding. And they go forward toward a pivotal trial. They, they, they uh, meet with FDA. And I can't tell you all the details of what happened. Uh, but they choose to do a 510K route. And, <clears throat> and for you guys who may not be familiar, 510K says, this is a, a, a fast track approach where we try to streamline approval of devices. But the company needs to prove that it is essentially equivalent to a predicate device, a predicate device that already exists and has already been approved. And so again, company decision, that's what they choose to do. And what I'm going to do now is just simply present that data. Uh, I'll present the six month data and then the 12 month follow up data as well. Uh, multiple places, of course, with the lead center. Uh, I think rehab, Charlotte, Re Charlotte Institute of Rehabilitation was, uh, was one of our uh, sites, as well as uh, Cleveland Clinic, Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation, Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, RIC, as well as the uh, University of Pennsylvania. So I'm not going to give you all the details, but here are the key inclusion criteria. We took chronic stroke survivors. Some would argue greater than three months is not chronic, but I think I'll show you later, as I'll show you later on, most of these patients were quite beyond this time period. Uh, they have to have clinical subluxation. Uh, they have to have shoulder pain, at least a two on BPI question 12. Because BPI question 12 requires them to remember last seven days, they also have to exhibit adequate memory. Also because many stroke survivors have uh, 
visuospatial abnormalities, they also have to demonstrate they can use a 0 to 10 numeric rating scale. Um, in addition to supraspinatus and the posterior deltoid, we elected to also stimulate the middle deltoid and the trapezius. Six hours a day for six weeks. This group also received a sling. And the control group, also, uh, control group, all they received was a sling. A primary hypothesis was the participants treated with intramuscular electrical stimulation will exhibit significantly greater reduction in shoulder pain compared to controls. Secondary uh, outcomes are uh, the degree to which pain interferes with daily activity. That's really a, a misnomer. This is really not daily activity. It's actually a quality of life measure, which I'll show you a little later. We want to look from a mechanistic perspective, subluxation, motor recovery, pain-free range of motion, hypertonia, and disability compared to controls. So we were referred 562 patients. 157 were found to be eligible. However, only 61 chose to enroll primarily because of anxiety of the minimum, minimal invasive procedure. We randomized 32 to the treatment group and 29 to the control group. However, the study was terminated before full accrual of 66 patients. And the reason it was terminated is because um, neural control was a little antsy about the slow recruitment rate. They elected to do a uh, interim analysis on the 61 and realized that even if five additional were uh, in and they were all negative, it wouldn't change the results. So they chose to stop the study at 61 instead of 66. Having said that, I'll show you the results. Of course, in any randomized clinical trial, the first thing you have to do is show us, show the audience that the randomization was good. And for the most part, it was. The age, uh, demographics, uh, gender distribution, uh, stroke onset, uh, stroke type. Uh, here, here, stroke onset is 123 weeks. That's the average. You know, considering there's 52 weeks in a year, that's quite, these are chronic stroke survivors. Um, stroke characters are also quite similar, as well as use of specific medications. When we looked at the outcome measures, there was a little bit of difference. The treatment group actually appeared to have worse pain. Uh, their BPI-12 score is 7.6 compared to 6.5, and this, and this is a trend towards significance. BPI-23, which is the pain interference of quality of life, was also a little bit higher, uh, but not as, not as significant as a control group. But otherwise, all the other measures looked actually pretty similar. The pain-free external rotation range of motion, subluxation, fugal myomotor motor assessment, spasticity, disability, and so on. This is our longitudinal analysis. As you can see here, the blue is the intramuscular electrical stimulation. The red is the control. Uh, as indicated, the uh, intramuscular stimulation group had a higher pain at baseline, 7.5. But with, by end of treatment, this came down all the way to three, and it was maintained, as you can see here. The control group just experienced a gradual decline in pain, which is what you would expect uh, uh, from a non-treated uh, interventional group. Uh, this uh, graph also shows the results. The solid line represents the uh, intent to treat protocol, and the, uh, and the, and, and the dashed line uh, is the uh, per protocol. So the per, per protocol intent to treat had very similar results. So overall, the, the results look quite good, and this was, uh, uh, was significant. But in order to address this clinical relevance of an intervention, you have to say, well, what is clinically important? And so we came up with a metric where we used what we knew was the minimum clinically important difference in pain studies, and that is in a 0 to 10 numeric grading scale, individuals must reduce their pain by two points to be considered clinically important, or 30%. And so we said, well, if, we, if a stroke patient reduces their pain by two points and is maintained throughout follow-up, then we say that's clinically important and that's, that's valuable. If the patient experiences two-point reduction but obviously goes up to, loses that, then we say there appears to be a short-term effect but no long-term effect and therefore not clinically important. If a stroke patient has, does not have two-point reduction at end of treatment but does so at 12 months, we say, well, that's probably not real. It's not, probably not specific to the actual um, uh, intervention. So having said that, what is the success rate if you use a two-point criteria or a 30% criteria? Well, turns out success rate, even for the treatment group, is only 63%. Not a great difference, not, not a great uh, 
number. Now, compared to the control group, it's 21%. This is statistically very, very good. But from a clinical perspective, boy, I really wish I could have more than 63% success rate. If you use the 30% criterion, that, that number comes down to 56%. So statistically significant, but from a clinical perspective, I would say, gee, for that invasive procedure, I would have loved to have a better success rate. Secondary measures, BPI-23, uh, let me just describe that for a second, uh, is the degree to which the pain interferes with the following uh, domains, general activity, mood, walking, normal work, relationships, sleep, and enjoyment of life. And I think you can agree with me, these domains are not, this is not activities of daily living, this is quality of life. And there was a significant reduction in BPI-23 as well. However, there was no effect on Fugelmeyer. Arm motor ability test, subluxation, external rotation range of motion, spasticity, therapy utilization, or medication use, which is very perplexing. So now all these, both groups declined, so which explains why the case series seem to have improved, because that's what they're going to do anyway. So both the control group and the treatment group showed improvements in these measures, but when you compare the two together, they were not significant. In terms of adverse events, it was actually quite good. Uh, there was no infection at the electrocyte, uh, no broken electrodes during treatment. However, during removal, six of 156 electrodes uh, broke. And it wasn't the tip, actually. It actually left a fair amount of length uh, behind, contrary to what we had thought that maybe only the distal tip would break, but it was actually several centimeters that would be left behind. Um, infections or granuloma uh, from broken electrodes, we didn't see any. Uh, now, at the electrode exit site, we did see granulomas, but after the electrodes were removed, these things disappeared, and we weren't concerned about it. As expected, there was some bruising and swelling at the needle insertion sites, and that, again, resolved without treatment. Skin irritation from the adhesives was common, but uh, again, not very significant. Uh, so overall, the adverse event rate was, was quite good. So from my perspective, the risk associated with the use of intramuscular electrical stimulation, as demonstrated by the randomized clinical trial, were minimal. Adverse events in particular were minor and all resolved without uh, treatment. With respect to effectiveness and safety, the primary endpoint was met. The electrical stimulation reduces hemiplegic shoulder pain and the effect is enduring for 12 months post-treatment. Also improves pain-related quality of life. It appears to be safe and, and risks are minimal. So our conclusion based on this study was that intramuscular electrical stimulation is effective and safe in reducing hemiplegic shoulder pain among chronic stroke survivors. So you would think that maybe this would go in well, because I don't know if you all know, it's 510K, in most cases, there's, you don't present data. It's basically a paper argument. This is what we have. It's substantially equivalent to what you've already approved. And so our perspective at the time was, wow, this is overkill. We did a randomized clinical trial. Unfortunately, things don't always work out that way. And it was a disapproved. And it was disapproved for the following reasons. Inadequate predicate. A sling is not a, an acceptable predicate. The fact of the matter is, what was the predicate? What could you use as a predicate? And so because of that, they said, that's the major reason. Second, you didn't tell us you're going to do an interim analysis. And you didn't tell us you're going to do early stoppage of the study. So. You terminated the study prior to accrual of participants, so you violated the protocol. That next, they said there's inadequate control in accounting for concomitant therapies, including pain medication. I agree with them. It was inadequate accounting for this. Was, this was very difficult to account for. It was very difficult to control our patients and what medications they took, or for them to even tell us what medications they took and didn't take, and how much. Well, some degree back to the drawing board, so I left that with neural control for them to deal with. But for me, I said, you know, I got to move on. I got to ask some more questions. Why is it such a low success rate? And so I took the data that we had and did some logistic regression. We looked at only the treatment subjects and asked the question, what predicts treatment success? So our dependent variable was treatment success based on the 2 point and 30% criterion. 
our explanatory variables or the, uh, or the independent variables who are the uh, patient characteristics, demographics, stroke characteristics. And when we did this analysis, the only thing that came out significant was time from stroke. If they had this intervention within 18 months of their stroke, that was significant. But, but at beyond 18 months, it was different. Well, how so? So we did this analysis. It's a little busy slide. This uh, represents individuals who received treatment within 18 months of their stroke. What a dramatic drop from eight all the way down to one, and they stay there. It looks like the Dutch data. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? In contrast, this little dashed line are the people who were treated beyond 18 months. And by the way, this is the control group right here. So this is interesting. Individuals who were 18, beyond 18 months, they, they had some treatment uh, effect at end of treatment. But by three months, whoops, sorry about that. Three months, they were approaching the controls again. So it appears that if you're beyond 18 months in this post hoc analysis, you go back to baseline, so it's not enduring. But if you have less than 18 months, the effect appears to be enduring. And if you look at from the uh, criterion perspective, you see that two-point criterion is a 90% success rate compared to those who are uh, beyond 77, which is 30%. And 30% and, and reduction was very similar. Again, 30% reduction rate, reduction criteria is much more rigorous. But essentially, the, the results are very similar. Well, let's go back to neural control. It's time to regroup. So they go back to FDA and said, well, how do we do this differently now? They said, you need a predicate. And I said, surface simulation? No, because surface simulation is not an approved modality for shoulder pain, in spite of all the data, by the way. They said, because they're looking at what FDA has already approved, and FDA has not approved surface stimulation for shoulder pain subluxation. What they approved was TENS for pain in general. So they said TENS. In fact, when you use TENS, you can't just simply use it six hours a day. They can use it whenever, because that's how it was approved. So whereas electrical stimulation, you only limit to six hours a day, TENS you can use forever. You can use it for even beyond the study period. Boy, something was not sounding right, but this is what they chose to do. Um, we chose the same study population, uh, treated for six weeks, followed for six months, mainly because we felt like uh, the 12-month data was really uh, superfluous, and they, they accepted that. Um, much tighter control of concomitant therapies, and looked at weekly outcomes assessment via telephone as versus every three months. Well. We did this for a little while, and then another pothole, maybe an abyss. Let a patient die. Um, about the 50th patient, by the way. This patient had electrode-related infection. This patient failed to return for the first follow-up visit after implantation. He was a diabetic, and he was self-treating, but did not inform us. And. Uh, this, this was a different site, actually, but, uh, uh, but this patient did not show up. Uh, he finally showed up several days after the scheduled appointment, and this whole arm, beefy red, purulent discharge. The electrodes were removed, started on antibiotics, and he was responsive to the antibiotics. However, in hospital day number three, he collapsed after going to the bathroom and died. There was no next of kin, and the medical examiner declined to do an autopsy. How did they do that? I thought they were required by law to do an autopsy on the person who dies in hospital when it's not expected. You know, actually, we actually pursued this quite vigorously, and they refused to do it. Uh, and, and of course, there was no next of kin, so we couldn't ask a family member. And so, cause of death is unknown. My guess is that he had the infection, caused hypercoagulable state, either had a myocardial infarction, had a clot in his leg, and threw a pulmonary embolus. Just, just my speculation at this point. So we don't know why this guy died. And it may be nothing, it may not at all be related to the infection at all. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Invacare, who owned NeuroControl, had an internal audit uh, by their accounting. And they were told that whatever money you spend in NeuroControl has to be part of Invacare finances. 
Until that time, it was not. And based on that, they said, we can't go on. But it was really, we had actually had a, a grant funded, <laughs> you know, one point, a two, two million dollar grant from NIH who was ready to give to us, but this company was no longer, and we could not accept, we could not accept, the, uh, accept the grant. The company closed in June of 2007, with 56 participants enrolled, all lectures removed. So, I, mean, I don't know if this is, maybe this is just real life in science, I don't know. But I'm just being honest with you all. This is what's, what happened. Um, but you know, we just can't die. We've got, we've got to persevere. There, there's more to science than having a company fold. Um, I had still ongoing questions. Even if the FDA approved the device, would the clinical world accept the intervention? And I wasn't sure. Why? Well, the clinical trial shows superiority over a sling. It was neither best practice, nor was it usual care. I think it's better than what I normally experience clinically, but I wasn't sure if the, if the clinical world would accept that. And furthermore, what about those who are beyond 18 months? So with these new set of questions, I decided to go forward. And so I investigated, and of course, as I indicated before, what was best practice, and clearly all best practice uh, parameters suggest that surface electrical stimulation needs to be included. But not only that, also therapeutic exercises. Now, evidence for therapeutic exercise is not as strong as surface electrical stimulation. But in general, there was appeared to be a consensus that best practice for shoulder pain and hemiplegia was electrical stimulation and therapeutic exercises. So in evidence-based review, TZL said there's moderate evidence that overhead pulleys worsen pain, and moderate evidence that gentle range of motion reduces pain. The VA uh, practice guidelines, again, says avoid overhead pulleys, but recommend a general a gentle lateral range of motion, stretching, mobilization techniques, ice, heat, uh, soft tissue massage, and shoulder girdle strengthening based on fair evidence. And this may be effective in reducing shoulder pain. The Ottawa panel, again, also said avoid overhead pulleys, recommend gentle range of motion exercise by qualified clinicians. All these other approaches uh, were inconsistent throughout the three uh, approaches, and th thus I excluded them from so-called so best practice. So I said, well, maybe I should compare intramuscular electrical stimulation with best practice. And so I submitted an R01 application with that in mind, chose to enroll chronic stroke survivors who had shoulder pain and subluxation for only for three to 18 months, okay, just to be consistent with our post hoc data. So it's a randomized clinical trial, one group obviously receiving intramuscular electrical stimulation. The best practice group using, uh, uh, receiving both surface electrical stimulation as well as outpatient therapies. And by the way, this makes a lot of sense because surface electrical stimulation in isolation is not going to work in real practice. When it was originally developed, it was developed in the context of inpatient rehabilitation, which we no longer have now in that inpatient rehabilitation is only two or three weeks post-stroke. Outpatient therapy, however, may work very well because these individuals will come in two or three times a week. And they will be able to work with a the therapist in positioning these electrodes and perhaps changing parameters. So I thought, you know, if surface electrical stimulation is going to work, this is the only way it's going to work. Of course, this caused an imbalance now. How could you give outpatient therapy to best practice and not to intramuscular electrical stimulation? So in anticipation of the review panel's questions, um, well, let's go ahead and use outpatient therapy. So that group also received outpatient therapy. Uh, they were treated for six weeks as per usual and they were followed up for six months, and our AIM-1 was looking at BPI-12, AIM-2 was looking at quality of life, and AIM-3, which I was less concerned about, was mechanistic, uh, looking at subluxation, motor impairment, and spasticity. With respect to expected result, um, we can power this study based on the, certainly with respect to the intramuscular stimulation, we can power it based on our post-hoc analysis, but what about best practice? Well, I had no idea what best practice would do, um, so I said, well, in order for this to be clinically implemented, it has to be better than best practice. It has to be better beyond the so-called minimum clinically important difference, which fortunately for pain has been well defined as at least two point or 30 percent improvement. So using that data, using the variance uh, that I have from my preliminary data, we came up uh, with a sample size uh, using alpha 0.05, power of 90 percent, and 45 per group. And this doesn't account for the 18 percent dropout. I think with a, with a dropout, I think we said about 110 total. And so this is what we submitted to the NIH. 
And what did they say? So I want your feedback, by the way. They were OK with it, but no cigar. So a, score, a priority score 200 and uh, 36 percent, uh, percentile. What were their issues? Not enough clinical impact. What happens if the two groups are similar? You need a usual care group. In other words, <laughs> you, in other words, you said, well, by definition, best practice is not real, right? Because nobody does it. <laughs> you know, that was in part a result of the big um, Bruce Dawkins yes. study where they didn't have a usual care group. Yeah. And so they ended up doing a historical control at the end. It's funny that when, when, when Steve Wolf did his study, he was criticized for doing a usual care group. <laughs> you know, I think it's, maybe this is how we act in study panels. Whatever you didn't do, you're going to be dinged for. <laughs> so anyway, so, that, so that, that was that. Then they said, well, there may be other factors that affect clinical acceptance, you know. You need a survey assessing the interference of intervention on daily activity. And by the way, you need to do a cost effectiveness analysis. So one side of the study section was into this clinical impact. And then the other side chimed in. Comparison, of, this is really a comparison of compliance rates. It's not particularly interesting. In an ideal environment with ideal parameters, two will be the same. So what you have to do, you gotta maximize the compliance rate for the surface stimulation group. Okay? Then somebody else said, too many differences between groups because intramuscular stimulation we were able to stimulate 12 hertz, constant duty cycle, because I didn't have to change it, because patients tolerate that. But for the surface stimulation, they were going at 25 to 35 hertz, because they can't tolerate lower stimulation frequency. And I had to change the duty cycle from a real marginal to high later on. So there was a, th those are the differences. So these are the difference between surface stimulation and intramuscular stimulation. They said, no, 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 you can't do that. All parameters must be exactly the same. By the way, you got to evaluate mechanisms. You had nothing about mechanisms here. So this is a, I'm just kind of surprised that it was priority scores only 200, not 300 based on these, because these are hard to address. And I'll tell you why. The tension. The tension that I saw here, a difference between explanatory clinical trials and a pragmatic clinical trial. An explanatory clinical trial focused on efficacy treatment effect in an idealized laboratory environment. Whereas pragmatic looks at effectiveness, treatment effect in anticipated clinical practice. Explanatory clinical trials focus on internal validity, tight control of variables, focus on mechanism, i.e. biologic effect. Pragmatic trial says external validity, so what? Often have looser control of variables, focus on generalizability, utility in clinical practice. So at the end, I asked the question, can a phase two clinical trial be completely explanatory, pragmatic, and demonstrate cost effectiveness? Well, there's no way you can do this in a phase two clinical trial. It's tough on a phase three clinical trial. Now, I happen to know all the reviewers. And I know that because this, um, this particular grant goes to my study section. And because I'm a member of that study section, they had to put an ad hoc study section. The ad hoc study section had only four members. There was only one application. <laughs> so I can figure out who it was. And, and based on their background, it was really a, an interesting experience. Um, there was one basic scientist. Actually, there were three basic scientists and one clinician, a very young clinician. And so I don't know how you would address this, but let me tell you how I addressed it and let me know how I did. So here's an introduction to my resubmitted application. We thank the reviewers for their thorough and thoughtful review of our application. By the way, you always have to say that, if you, whether you believe that or not. The reviewers raised important concerns that threaten internal and external validity of the proposed study. While we endeavor to address both types of concerns, these are often inherently in conflict with one another. This is well understood. We made a concerted effort to reduce threats to internal validity. Nevertheless, given previous demonstration of the superiority of intramuscular and surface electrical simulation compared to controls, and the, review, and the reviewer's emphasis on impact in clinical practice, the clinical trials revised to be more pragmatic in nature, with higher priority placed on effectiveness and external validity. I recognize that I can't address all of them. So I have to choose which one am I going to go. And I chose based, the, the individuals who are pushing clinical effectiveness 
I thought were stronger in the review. And so I elected to go with them. It was also easy for me to address. So I revised the application. Uh, certainly we had intramuscular electrical stimulation with outpatient therapy, best practice. Um, as per their request, I chose to put usual care. The problem is, what is usual care? We have no idea. Because when you do these surveys, they're all over the board. There's no consensus as to what usual care is. So I said, OK. One of the reviewers suggested, how about just getting the therapies? OK, so now I can't get faulted. You know, OK, you, you recommend a therapy. That's what, that's what I'll do. I'll give you outpatient therapy. But the mechanists in there are going to say, gee, but look at the other groups. They have electrical stimulation. This group doesn't. And so I said, all right, I'll give you electrical stimulation. I'll give you sensory stimulation without motor activation. It probably has some therapeutic effect, by the way. But this is one way to kind of balance the higher emphasis of external validity, but also maintain some internal validity as well. My expected results, um, what I chose to do is I chose to provide, this is the uh, usual care group, I chose to give them a clinically important improvement from relative baseline, which was fine, which is good, because the difference between this and this is so big that the actual power analysis is not significantly affected besides the addition of a third group. And because of the challenge of additional, uh, challenge of additional uh, group, I elected to go back to the more traditional power of 80% instead of 90%. This came out with 34 per group. After you adjust for dropout, it comes out to a total of 126 patients over a five-year period. So this is one way to respond. <clears throat> Uh, for clinical impact, I chose to uh, add the modified BPI-23, which says, I want you to rate the degree to which the treatment protocol interfered with all these things. And then uh, there are other factors that uh, they asked for, which can't, some can address, some cannot. Average events of medical risk are easy. That's part of clinical trial anyway. They wanted us to address the impact of a need for clinician training in clinical acceptance. I said, well, that's kind of ridiculous. You don't do that at this phase. You do that later on. Cost effectiveness, similarly, you can't do this in this phase. So I gently said, maybe in later phase three trials, we can do this. Treatment compliance is something that needs to be addressed. Um, and this is a, a, a quote that I think uh, comes in very handy. Differentiating efficacy, explanatory trials, and pragmatic. There was a group in this uh, review panel who thought that this was not an important factor. In fact, this was not interesting at all. And so I, let's share this with you. It says, efficacy studies assess differences in effect between two or more conditions under ideal, highly controlled conditions, while effectiveness studies assess differences in effect between two or more conditions when used in normal, real-world clinical circumstances. Explanatory trials deal with efficacy, whereas pragmatic trials are more closely associated with effectiveness. A particular treatment approach might be shown to be efficacious, but may prove not to be clinically effective. An example of this could be an extremely complicated, time-consuming physiotherapy exercise regime. In a university research environment with a participant conveniently selected from a keen student population and financially compensated for their time, the treatment works very well. However, upon transfer to the clinical environment where patients may not have the same time and energy reserves, participants may not perform the exercise regime at all. The result is a treatment with demonstrated efficacy from a highly controlled trial proving ineffective when utilized in a standard clinical situation. So, this in the, so surface electrical stimulation in a highly structured, idealized environment works well. But in real life, it doesn't work at all. A pragmatic trial tries to differentiate these effects. And I realize that in this particular audience, this is probably more of a foreign concept because I think most of the work you guys do is efficacy. But when it, in order to get to the real clinical world, you've got to demonstrate effectiveness. And, and pragmatic trials are very hard to do as a result. So non-adherence is actually a major part of clinical practice, even if the reviewers have failed to recognize that. Pragmatic trials ask, does a treatment work in a real clinical situation or the anticipated real clinical situation where for a variety of reasons treatment application and adherence may not be ideal? Any effort of maximizing adherence in that clinical trial must be clinically realistic. For example, I could have a therapist go to the patient's home every day to put those electrodes on. But what world does this 
belong in. We can't do that. No insurance company in the world will be able to pay for that, or is it going to be willing? So that intervention is an efficacy trial, but has no relevance in real life. Surface electrical stimulation with motor activation can only be done in the context of outpatient therapies, as versus just simply home alone in the present healthcare environment. And so the present paradigm that I presented was really tried to, yes, we're going to maximize uh, compliance in an environment that's clinically realistic. Now, to address that question, all, this, all, this, uh, all the subjects will have a data logger in their stimulator to see what they actually do, to see how much of an explanatory factor that is. Uh, stimulation parameters, um, what a hassle. So I, I felt like I had to address it, and yet it had to be realistic. Um, the frequency, uh, uh, frequency uh, was left at 12 hertz for intramuscular and for usual practice because they will be able to tolerate this just fine. But for best practice, what I chose to do, they'll start at 12 hertz, which they won't tolerate, by the way, and they will be asked to adjust the tolerance to, and to keep the lowest frequency possible. The duty cycle for the intramuscular and usual practice will be 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. For best practice, we'll start at 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off, but slowly increase to the point where it becomes 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. Duration of stimulation will be six hours for the intramuscular and usual practice. For the best practice, they'll start at two hours a day. At the end of week one, it'll be up to six hours, but by mid, uh, middle of week three, they have to be seven hours, so that everybody gets the exact same amount of actual stimulation after accounting for the duty cycle. So whether they'll be satisfied by this, I, I have no idea, but this is my best effort to make the parameters as equivalent as possible. Mechanisms and treatment components. Uh, Again, pragmatic studies identify utility of a treatment for clinical practice where explanatory looks at biological effects. And the emphasis being pragmatic, uh, I basically said this is not the focus of the study. Uh, pragmatic trials answer questions about the overall effectiveness of an intervention and cannot study the contribution of its different components. You would use a pragmatic trial to test an overall package of care, including the contribution of therapeutic relationships, patient expectations, and any specific therapy that is used, you would generally compare the effect of this package of care with another treatment, not with a placebo. Nevertheless, we did elect to maintain those three parameters, diffugomeyer, subluxation, as well as uh, uh, hypertonia, uh, just to look at what is the general mechanism of, of uh, how this might work. Will all this work? With respect to the NIH, that is. You know, uncertain, so I would appreciate your feedback. There are culture issues here, and this is not typically what NIH funds. But I thought NIH likes novelty, so why not, why not contribute? After all, NIH is all about healthy people, isn't it? I think they need to be clinically relevant. I plan on resubmitting on November 4th. Based on your feedback, I may change a lot of things. Real quickly, what about those beyond 18 months post-stroke? Um, my recommendation at this point is to pursue a permanent implant, muscle-based uh, or nerve-based, and I believe uh, there is a uh, clinical uh, value as well as, as a market for that as well. Future directions, a lot of questions remain. Biomechanical instability as a cost needs to be investigated. I'm hoping that Bob Kirsch and his crew would go to that area. Subacromial inflammation as well as capsule inflammation, I believe, are important parameters. And there are specific treatments for that using intracortical, intraarticular, subacromial corticosteroids as well as oral steroids. Um, subscapularis hypertonia. There's the emerging evidence that neurolysis of the subscapularis may indeed reduce shoulder pain in certain individuals. Uh, so there, in fact, we, we, I don't show it here, but we've actually done a, a fair amount of additional work using uh, anti-inflammatory agents in stroke as well uh, for shoulder pain. I want to acknowledge these individuals. Um, David Yu, who I trained, uh, he's not here with us anymore. By the way, David is working on the Mayans in, uh, in Seattle. Uh, Dr. Frost, uh, Steve Flanagan from Mount Sinai, Ellie Elevick from Kessler. Uh, Ellie is probably going to move on to Utah. Martin Eisenman and Rusing, uh, he's moved on to University of Twentu. Um, Richard Zorowitz was at University of Pennsylvania. He's now at Hopkins. Um, and also Z Ping Fang and Maria Bennett. Maria, by the way, that, that first case series uh, Maria used as her uh, master's thesis here, as well as Julie Grill. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, funding, this, especially this first $10,000 that uh, Bob reviewed. That was really where it all started. Um, and as well as to SBIR phase one and two from NICHD, as well as David Hughes K 12. 
and also the National Re Center for Research Resource, the GCRC, the VA, who, by the way, the VA paid for half my salary when I first came here to start my career, and then Neurocontrol Corporation. I want to uh, formally thank Dr. Shea for um, bringing us, us this um, very interesting presentation, and this is just an indication thank of our you. appreciation. One is the early, early intervention data. Yes. Muscles, uh, their strength deteriorates very, very quickly if they're not used. So this doesn't surprise me at all. Mm. Um, then the second question is, I guess the experience I've had over my career with uh, PMNR is that early intervention is really hard, a concept that I've found very, very hard to get over. I much, much more enjoyed working with surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> that, that crowd, you can move fast. And so I just wonder, you know, how this kind of thing plays out. It seems like there is a cultural issue, which you brought up in the end, of getting PM&R to think in terms of early intervention, and it's, it's kind of perplexes me why they don't see the muscle deteriorating so quickly, within days, and uh, why, why this would be a, not be a surprise, that get this thing going earlier and, and it should work. Yeah. Well, you shouldn't get me started on PM&R because um, I'm, I'm probably one of their harsh, harshest critics. Uh, innovation is not their strong point. Uh, it is a naturally conservative group. A certain group of people go into PM&R, and, 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 and how they look at science is reflected by that. Uh, some would say, I, I, I don't fit that mold, um, but I think there's some hope. And, and there's, especially of late, uh, of late there's a lot of young PM&R physicians who are <clears throat> Uh, not thinking that way. You know, for example, when I first started residency, um, I had some background in, 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 in osseous bone formation uh, during my master's. And so my first rotation was amputee service. And everybody's worrying about this interfaces between the prosthesis and the, and the skin. And I said, I just made a very naive statement to my attending physician. I said, why don't we just simply attach these things <laughs> skeletally? <clears throat> so well, that's a good idea, but we don't do that. We'll just leave it to plastic surgeons. And at that point, I said, Boy, this is really frustrating. And so there is a uh, culture like that that exists. <clears throat> now having said that, um, there is an emerging culture where the young physiatrists are becoming much more procedure oriented. Uh, they, they're not afraid of doing needles, doing cuts. And, uh, and this has been really uh, buttressed by the musculoskeletal component of rehabilitation. I think the neurorehabilitation component still probably resides in that area, but the musculoskeletal guys are doing spine injections, a lot more invasive. And so because of that, they want to jump in a lot earlier. That's one. Number two, the NIH really hasn't helped on this either. Because uh, when we try to do something on the acute, you know, what do they say? Ah, too much variability. Do it in the chronic first, okay? And so in fact, my first, um, I have a clinical trial in foot drop, and I proposed a randomized clinical trial in the acute stroke population. Because I think if there's going to be neurological recovery using peroneal nerve stimulation, it's going to happen in the acute population, not later on. Well, they dinged it because, no, acute's not good. Too many variability. Go do chronic. In my mind, it's not going to work. But I wasn't stupid. I said, OK. And that's what I did. And eventually got funded on the chronic. The, the effects are small. But that's exactly what I would have expected, no matter how big your numbers are. And so the NIH has not helped us any either. The, the individuals at, in the review panels are also conservative, and they're not PM&R docs. You know, they're basic scientists and, and, and clinicians. And so, uh, so there are two things going on. I think the NIH doesn't help, uh, and, the, uh, and the culture of PM&R doesn't help. But I think hopefully both are, both are moving. And, and we were actually able to do some additional studies, uh, get additional acute studies uh, funded by making some very good arguments. And I think that's what we need to do. Bob. So I, I had one question and a point. Uh, the question is, could you argue that a study could not be effective if there wasn't intrinsic efficacy? Um, so that jumping to a pragmatic study, which is what you want to do, uh, that 
if you get a result, it would imply that you're doing something beneficial. Yes, yeah, so can you jump to an efficacy study without demonstrating efficacy? And uh, first of all, the line between efficacy and effectiveness is not as clear cut as people like to think. Uh, the question of efficacy always usually deals with biologic. So is there a sub re reduction of subluxation? Well, yes, I mean, it's, it's kind of trivial. I mean, if you stimulate, it does reduce subluxation. And, and in fact, when, when it's on, people say, I have less pain. Um, I think we can justify a pragmatic study uh, because there's already a clinical trial with intramuscular electrical stimulation compared to a control that's more on a level of efficacy. Surface electrical stimulation is also plenty of studies already showing that's effective compared to a control group. So to, in some degree, efficacy has already been demonstrated before the intramuscular and surface electrical stimulation. The question now is, does it make sense in real life? So I think we can make the argument. But again, uh, because the line between efficacy and effectiveness is not always clear, uh, I think I could claim that efficacy studies have already been done. Do you have a second question? I can't remember. It's actually a point. In, in addition to, to what Dr. Mortimer suggested in terms of muscle weakness, comparing the newer versus uh, more chronic patients in terms of their response, do you think, don't, don't you think there's also a component of osteoarthritis that's developed, I mean, um, and, and soft tissue fibrosis mm -hmm. that would be harder to overcome, and so they may start to get better or improve somewhat, but when you stop the stimulation, they regress back. Yeah, I, I believe that's going to be true. And that's why I don't recommend this for individuals for 18 months, because you have a short-term benefit. So that's why I'm recommending a, a, actually a permanent implant for individuals for greater than 18 months. Yes, Janice. Um, I had two thoughts. Um, they probably aren't going to be much help for your application, but they could be of some theoretical help or maybe a help for a, a mechanism study, okay. um, a clinical study. Um, in your conceptual diagram, I was thinking that you could add something in there. And you've got what are you've already got. It's a very pretty complete a conceptual diagram um, already, and you've got what happens within the subject or the patient, but there's also a set of, of um, events that happens to the subject. Like, um, so the, my point for, on that topic would be that um, patients, when they're transferred by AIDS and other helpers, um, Right where it says muscle atrophy and weakness and mechanical instability, mm -hmm. there's an impact on that joint and that tissue um, by virtue of um, the, the, the patient being lifted by the humerus yes. on both sides. And they're, they're hanging from their ligaments. And the, there could be an injury to nerves. Or, or muscles or bursa at that point, and, and it could be such a traumatic injury, uh, repeated every day, many times a day, mm -hmm. that um, it could be very difficult um, to, to address with an inter any intervention, no right. matter how good it is. In fact, so, you know, go ahead. Pre, you, I'm sh you've probably already thought of all this, and so one intervention for, for shoulder pain and subluxation would really be prevention in clinical practice, which mm -hmm might ultimately be easier to address than a treatment after the fact. But of course, there are other reasons for, for shoulder pain. The second thought I had that uh, was on, along the lines of what Bob was just, um, just talking about, uh, that dotted line where the, the, um, the effect is, is good, the pain is going down, and then after the treatment stops, it, it yes. goes back up again. Well, it seems to me that what might be happening, at least one of the things that might be happening, would be that um, when the electrical stimulation is being offered, it is uh, improving the balance of forces at the joint, and so there's no impingement on the nerve or no trauma to the, to the um, joint tissue. And, and, but then we, we, we're not stretching the, um, the, tight, the tight tissue. Yep. Mm -hmm. We're only stimulating the, the weak tissue on one side of the joint. Mm -hmm. um, so as soon as we stop the treatment, if we haven't uh, stretched the tight tissue so that it doesn't 
spring back into its old position, as soon as we stop the uh, muscle activation on one side of the joint, it's going to just return to its painful position. Right. So that was what I was. No, I think those points are excellent. Um, the, uh, it, in fact, one of my first patients with shoulder pain, it was an inpatient uh, service, and um, I knew he was self-lux. I knew that shoulder was really at risk. And he had no pain for a while. And then one day, I come in. He said, oh, Dr. Che, this shoulder is killing me. And then he said, well, what happened? You know, when I woke up this morning, my arm was stuck under the, under the bar. And so the question of trauma is real. And that's why I, 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 I feel this micro risk for micro macro trauma is very important. There are multiple ways this happens. And one of them is how we manage our patients. And so almost all practice guidelines will say proper positioning and prevention. Unfortunately, that's a very hard intervention to study. I mean, how do you do that? And how do you look at outcomes? And some of the studies that has been done has been negative. But that doesn't mean it's not effective. It just means that we just don't know how to measure that. Uh, the second uh, comment you made is you know, you're speaking just like a clinician, which is great. And what I mean by that is that you know, in science, as you go more toward efficacy, we want to keep everything the same and change one variable at a time. Well, in clinical practice, we can't do that. You know, we got to do multiple things. And you're right. So I, I think you know, uh, shoulder pain can develop into a huge program where right now, for example, I'm investigating not only electrical stimulation, but I'm also looking at inflammation in the joint as well as subacromia bursa. But not only that, um, I have this sinking suspicion that spasticity with periosteal um, traction is an important part of the pain generation. And so at the end, I think what's going to happen is that, you know, I would love to do synergy studies, but I need to make sure one, one intervention works. And then, as I, then we're going to develop diagnostic, diagnostic uh, ability to say, well, which part is contributing to this? Is it just mechanical? Is it spasticity? Or is it X, Y, and Z? And then be able to say, well, we have treatment for X, and we have treatment for Z. So I, my hope is that as we do this, that we have a rational diagno diagnosis-specific approach as versus, well, let's just do one thing, you know, one big shebang. Um, we have a, 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 another grant going in where we're actually looking at MRIs longitudinally from stroke onset where there's no shoulder pain to six months to a year where I know that 50% of my patients are going to develop shoulder pain. And look at the MRI compared to baseline and compared to the opposite shoulder. Right now, that data does not exist. We have data in cross-sectional studies where I take a stroke patient and just look at them as there are, and there are a lot of abnormalities. But what I don't know is are any of those abnormalities actually causing the pain. Okay. So this is a huge area with very little data. And, and at, at the end, um, I have to confess, when I treat my shoulder patients, and I've tried everything, I'm throwing the kitchen sink at it. I don't care if there's no data. And that's where I think, as a clinician, I feel, you know, the scientists can be out there and, and criticize me for doing this, but they're not calling you at night. You know, they're calling me and saying, it hurts. And I got to do something whether it's clinically justifiable, scientific justifiable or not. Yes, sir. Uh, quick question. In your selection criteria for your patients, did you rule out people who had complex regional pain syndromes? Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah, I, I think they're fundamentally different, uh, although I believe they probably start, uh, the data suggests that really in complex regional pain that it actually starts with trauma. It's the, the significant subluxation. And uh, that probably triggers this cascade of maybe autonomic, maybe sympathetic. You know, nobody really knows anymore. People are unwilling to say sympathetic anymore. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, you said earlier that you had a 63% success rate and you were disappointed because you wanted a, a solution for your patients. But, and yet you, you had like seven or eight uh, reasons for shoulder pain. I mean, do you, ex I mean, and all these questions and your answers are relating to, you know, you're, you can't cure them all with this one treatment. So right. I guess, may, were your expectations really that good or, or you just were hopeful or, or I mean, well, how you, are you going to present this? You always have to have reason to write more grants. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, your point is well taken. They may have just have a pain syndrome that's not amenable to that intervention because it's caused by something different. Um, 
So that's why we go back and look at it uh, retroactively, uh, post hoc, because that may still be the case. If that's the case, then my, my uh, post hoc analysis should not show me anything that is consistent with that. Uh, but in this particular case, I was really surprised by the post hoc analysis. And most post hoc analysis don't come out this good, by the way. And so you've got to be, always be suspicious of, is this, is this real, is it not? But it was quite dramatic. And, and there's some at least theoretical reasons why it might work, because this is muscle-based. You know, and if you if you do it early, it makes sense. And, and now there's also meta-analysis of shoulder subluxation studies, and they're saying it appears to be more effective early than late. It appears to be not effective in, in, in true chronic phases. All right, thank you very much. You're a great audience. <laughs>